You've probably heard that scuba diving is dangerous and it has something to do with pressure, air, nitrogen, the bends. Or you've already started scuba diving and you want to wrap your head around decompression sickness so that you can be well informed and stay safe in the water. So let's answer some of the most important questions about decompression sickness or DCS. What is decompression sickness? What makes it so dangerous? How do you get it? How do you even know if you've got it? How do you prevent it? What happens if you do get it? And what about those divers on oil rigs who go really deep for a long period of time? Why don't they get decompression sickness? If you're just getting started in diving, I've made a cheat sheet which you can download in the description of this video that'll give you a good idea of some of the equipment that I use and also where you can get started with the theory section of your open water diver course absolutely free. Right, so you're a scuba diver, but not all scuba divers are created equal. For simplicity, I'm going to stick to the basics. Well, not really. I'm gonna go into some detail, enough so that you get the full picture. To understand decompression sickness, you need to understand the relationship between pressure, gas, and time. There are recreational divers and there are technical divers. Then there's commercial divers and saturation divers. To keep things simple, let's take a look first at recreational diving, and later in this video, we'll get into saturation diving. The simplest explanation is that decompression sickness is caused by nitrogen. When you go scuba diving and you breathe compressed air, your body absorbs nitrogen. When you go back up to the surface, your body releases that nitrogen, and it's possible for those nitrogen microbubbles to group together and form a larger bubble that gets stuck in your body tissue. That's decompression sickness, or the bends. When you go scuba diving, you have to breathe underwater, and so you take a cylinder that's full of compressed air. Now, compressed air is safe to breathe. It's just like normal air that you breathe every day, except it's compressed into a smaller space. So instead of taking a single breath at the surface and holding that one breath like you would when you go snorkeling, you take a cylinder that's full of compressed air to last your entire dive. If you stand on the beach and you take a breath of air, that air is filled with 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen, give or take. The oxygen gets used up or burned and then breathed out in the form of carbon dioxide. Nitrogen will be absorbed by your body and stored in your body tissue. Once your body's absorbed as much nitrogen as it can hold, you'll breathe out the excess nitrogen. Now let's get a little deeper. When you're standing on the beach, there is air pressure equal to one atmosphere of pressure. Your body has already absorbed enough nitrogen to equal the surrounding or atmospheric pressure. Your body is now in equilibrium with the air pressure. As soon as you start your dive, the pressure increases, and that's because you have the one atmosphere of air pressure plus the additional water pressure. You breathe compressed air from your cylinder and your body starts to absorb the compressed nitrogen until the nitrogen in your body tissue is equal to the surrounding water pressure. Air pressure is equal to one atmosphere. For every additional 10 meters or 33 feet that you descend underwater, you gain an additional atmosphere. And that means that at 10 meters depth or 33 feet underwater, your body pressure is experiencing two atmospheres of pressure. The pressure has doubled. Water can't be compressed, but gas can. And so at 10 meters or 33 feet, when the pressure has doubled, the volume of air has been squeezed into half the space. A gas molecule like nitrogen has been squeezed or compressed to half its original size compared to the surface. Watch this balloon. When I pump air into the bottle, the balloon is in a chamber with higher pressure. You can see that the size of the balloon shrinks. Inside the balloon, there are the same number of air molecules, but they have been squeezed into a tighter space. Of course, the balloon is a large air pocket and the nitrogen that your body absorbs are molecular in size, microbubbles. If you spend long enough at 10 meters or 33 feet, then your body would absorb enough nitrogen until it was once again in equilibrium with the surrounding or atmospheric pressure. 
Much like the balloon, the nitrogen molecules get compressed, which leaves space in your body tissue for more nitrogen. If the pressure has doubled and those nitrogen molecules have been squeezed to half their original size, then the same space must be taken up by twice as many nitrogen molecules. And for those of you who are mathematically inclined, there's a formula for this. Standing on a beach with one atmosphere of pressure, the air mixture is always going to be 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen. Those percentages or ratios will never change. Science refers to the partial pressure of gases. And so one atmosphere is equal to 0.21 oxygen plus 0.79 nitrogen. This is important because when you descend to 10 meters or 33 feet and the atmospheric pressure has doubled to two atmospheres, the ratio of gas remains the same, but the partial pressure increases. And so at two atmospheres of pressure, you now have 0.42 oxygen and 1.58 partial pressure of nitrogen. You can see from the equation that the partial pressure of nitrogen has increased. So has the oxygen, but your body's still burning the oxygen and absorbing the nitrogen. The percentage of the mixture has not changed just the partial pressure. Theoretically, you can go really deep in the ocean and your body will continue to absorb nitrogen until the nitrogen in your body tissue is equal to the surrounding or atmospheric pressure. In practice, that's not true, but I'll explain more on that a little later in this video. For now, let's just concentrate on the nitrogen that your body absorbs while you descend. You see, the opposite is also true. When you ascend to the surface, your body will start to release that extra nitrogen that you absorbed on the way down. And that is where decompression sickness can come from. Nitrogen that your body's absorbed while you descend will start to be released as you ascend back to the surface. And that means it needs to come out of your body tissue. When you ascend slowly, the nitrogen comes out slowly and mixes with the oxygen in the air that you breathe. And you breathe it out the same as breathing it in. If you come up too quickly, the possibility exists for those nitrogen micro bubbles to group together and form a larger bubble before they can attach to the oxygen and be released in your breathing. If that happens and a bubble of nitrogen gets stuck in your body tissue, that's decompression sickness. But that's just the start of the story. Later in this video, we're gonna take a look at decompression diving and how saturation divers can stay at pressure for weeks while they complete work on pipelines and oil rigs. First, let's take a look at why decompression sickness is so dangerous and how you get it. The US Navy started using divers for missions and to work on their ship's hulls for maintenance. They noticed that divers would get sick and so they started to run experiments. Over time, they worked out that there is a relationship between depth and time. They created dive tables to approximate how long a diver could stay at a certain depth and return to the surface without any problems. These dive tables have evolved in many ways, but the principles are clear. When you breathe air at depth, you absorb nitrogen, which needs to be released slowly when you ascend to the surface but different parts of your body absorb and release nitrogen at different rates. As much as there is a good level of knowledge about how your different body tissues absorb nitrogen, there is no guarantee that you do or do not get decompression sickness. Now I know I've just said that there's mathematics involved and we can calculate exactly how much nitrogen there is at different pressures. We can give a very strong indication of when you will or won't get decompression sickness. And we can use a margin of safety, but we can't predict with exact accuracy because everybody's body is different, particularly when you approach the limits. We can say with near certainty when you've gone over the limits, and we can say it's far less likely that you get symptoms if you plan a safe dive plan. But there is no hard rule that says it's completely predictable. We know that soft tissue will absorb or on gas quickly, and equally so, it will release or off gas as quickly. Take your lungs for instance. Your lungs absorb oxygen and nitrogen and transfer that to your bloodstream instantly. We know that denser tissue like your joints will absorb nitrogen slowly and release it slowly. 
In fact, that's where the term the bends comes from. One of the most likely and often most recognizable symptoms is to feel pain in your joints and not to be able to fully straighten that joint. So you say it's bent, the bends. But between your lungs and your joints are a whole range of body tissue densities and how quickly or slowly nitrogen will be absorbed into those tissues will differ slightly from person to person. Recreational dive tables are quite conservative and they're designed to avoid the no decompression limits. That means when you're planning a dive using recreational dive tables, you can always ascend directly to the surface without having to stop for your body to release excess nitrogen before you make an ascent to the surface. Recreational dive tables will take a number of factors into account and use the most conservative absorption rates that will avoid your body tissue becoming saturated with nitrogen or equal to the surrounding atmospheric pressure. Because you avoid these decompression or saturation limits, the nitrogen in your body tissue will always have some space to expand and be released back into your bloodstream to join with the oxygen and breathed out. Now, how do you know if you've got decompression sickness? The symptoms for DCS can range from mild to severe or fatal. Severe and fatal, you'll probably recognize. It's more likely that you would possibly encounter a mild version of DCS. Personally, I've only seen DCS a handful of times and it's always been a milder version. You're working with a gas that is expanding and trying to escape your body. That gas could come out of your body tissue at any place. The most common, as we mentioned earlier, is a pain in your joints. Another reasonably common symptom is to see small bubbles develop under the skin and what looks like a rash. In some instances, you could even squeeze those bubbles. In more severe cases, those bubbles could form in your circulatory system. These are the ones that cause more damage if they get into your heart, your brain, or your spine. Other symptoms to look out for are itchy skin, headaches, and swelling. Divers with DCS often feel tired, agitated, uncomfortable, and nauseated. This often looks the same as seasickness, but it could possibly be your body's reaction to trying to get rid of a gas. So how do you avoid DCS? We've already discussed dive tables and avoiding the limits. In most instances, that's all you need, but there are other steps you can take. Nitrogen needs to flow easily into and out of your body. If your body's well lubricated with water, then it's easier for the nitrogen to flow in and out. If you're dehydrated, you increase the risk. Alcohol will dehydrate you, and that means having a heavy bender the night before is never a great idea. Staying physically fit will also help. Nitrogen can't flow easily through fatty tissue. It might take a long time to absorb, but it'll equally take a long time to off gas or release from any fatty tissue. You should always do a safety stop. A safety stop is a stop at five meters or 16 feet for three minutes in order for your body to release some nitrogen while you're still at pressure. This is not a decompression stop. As we said before, a recreational diver can always make a direct ascent to the surface. So this is not a compulsory stop, but rather a recommended safety precaution. Making a safety stop while still under pressure is proven to reduce the risk of DCS. In recent years, the procedure of doing a deep safety stop has been shown to further reduce the risk of DCS substantially. A deep safety stop is somewhere between your dive depth and your safety stop. A three to five minute deep safety stop will significantly improve your margin of safety. Now we haven't gone into depth in too much detail, except to say that at sea level you have one atmosphere of pressure, and when you get down to 10 meters or 33 feet, you have two atmospheres of pressure acting on your body. For every 10 meters or 33 feet you descend, you gain an additional atmosphere of pressure, which means at 40 meters, 131 feet, you have five atmospheres of pressure acting on your body. 40 meters or 131 foot is the recreational diving depth limit. At that depth, you only have around nine minutes before you have to make an ascent to the surface or run the risk of decompression sickness. You also have five atmospheres of pressure acting on your body, which means you breathe five times as much 
for every breath as you would at the surface. So you have a limited supply of air, but that's a topic for another video. Of course, you could take multiple cylinders and go deeper, right? Well, no. You see, this is where the recreational limits of scuba diving start to throw up a number of red flags. From the time you start your descent, you're ingassing more nitrogen. In theory, your body could absorb or ingas any amount of nitrogen, but in reality, that thicker, more condensed gas starts to slow down the receptors in your brain. This is called nitrogen narcosis, and most divers will start to notice a narcotic effect from around 30 meters or 99 feet. This is often referred to as the martini effect, where the deeper you go, it's like drinking another martini. A martini, shaken, not stirred. Your judgment becomes impaired, and beyond a certain depth, you wouldn't be able to focus or make decisions. As you ascend to the surface, the effects wear off as quickly as they appear. The other limiting factor is that your body can't tolerate 100% oxygen for any extended period of time. You may recall that the partial pressure of oxygen at one atmosphere is 0.21. At five atmospheres, or 131 feet, 40 meters, the partial pressure of oxygen is as much as 1.05. And that's the equivalent of breathing 100% oxygen. We've already mentioned that your body can't tolerate breathing 100% oxygen for any extended period of time. Any deeper than five atmospheres and your body would start to experience oxygen toxicity. Now, before we get into decompression, technical and saturation diving, let's take a look at what you need to do for somebody who has DCS. The care for a diver is simple. Under no circumstances should you ever take them back into the water. You might think it's a good idea to get them back under pressure and then bring them up slowly and everything will be okay. But all that you're going to do is add to the problems that you need to solve. The first thing you need to do is to get them onto oxygen. They need to breathe 100% oxygen. But we've already said that breathing pure oxygen can be toxic, and so from time to time you need to give them a break to breathe fresh air. The nitrogen in their body will attach to the increased proportion of oxygen and help to flush it out. The bigger piece of the puzzle is to get them to a recompression or hyperbaric chamber so that they can be pressurized in a controlled environment with medical staff on hand. In a hyperbaric chamber, they'll be pressurized and then brought back to a surface pressure in a controlled rate. And they'll be given an increased proportion of oxygen to help flush the nitrogen from their body tissue. In most mild cases, that's all that's needed. But in more severe cases, several trips to a hyperbaric chamber might be needed. So what about the long-term effects? Well, that's very much a case-by-case -case basis. Some mild symptoms may be gone quickly and never repeat. In more severe cases, you may never be able to dive again. Now, I'm sure you must be wondering why some divers can go down to work on oil rinks and pipelines that can be as deep as 100 meters or 300 feet. We've already said that your body can't handle the nitrogen or the oxygen in a normal air mixture when you get past 40 meters or 131 feet. And this is where it gets really interesting because you need to switch your mindset from recreational diving where you can always make a direct ascent to the surface into technical, decompression and saturation diving. In a moment, we're gonna take a look at mixing gases, but for now, let's start with breathing normal air and staying past the decompression limits. If you have enough air supply, you can stay at a particular depth for longer than the decompression limits. And this tips over into decompression diving. If you pass the no decompression limit, you can no longer make a direct ascent to the surface without stopping. You'll have to make a decompression stop or several decompression stops. These stops need to be planned out very carefully to ensure that your body has enough time to off gas at a particular depth before you continue your ascent to the surface. It's not uncommon for divers to spend several hours at a decompression stop and they often take a book with them to read while they're passing the time. But that still doesn't answer the question about guys diving really deep on oil rigs. Before we get there, let's add in some oxygen. 
Recreational divers can take courses about nitrox. Nitrox is the process of adding an increased proportion of oxygen into the mix that you breathe. Instead of diving with 21% oxygen, divers can increase that to as much as 40%, but more common mixtures are 32 or 36% oxygen. Now, if you paid attention and you're thinking that could be dangerous because of oxygen toxicity, then you'd be right. Increasing the proportion of oxygen can be good for extending the amount of time that you can spend at a particular depth, but it will limit the depth that you can dive to. In an oxygen-rich mixture, you are decreasing the amount of nitrogen that your body absorbs. But how does that help a diver on an oil rig? If he can't breathe an increased amount of oxygen because of oxygen toxicity, nor an increased amount of nitrogen because of nitrogen narcosis, how can he go so deep? Enter Trimix. Trimix is the process of mixing oxygen, helium, and nitrogen. At very deep depths, you can decrease the amount of oxygen and nitrogen and add helium into the mixture. The helium replaces the nitrogen in your body so that you don't get the narcotic effect of nitrogen narcosis. And the oxygen is reduced to the level that avoids oxygen toxicity for any given pressure. Okay, so we've solved the problem of depth, but what about the amount of time that they spend? We've said that if you go down for long periods of time that you need to make decompression stops on the way up. And that often means spending as much time or longer doing decompression stops as you do during your dive. When a diver working at 100 meters or 300 feet spends six to eight hours on a shift working at depth, they'll easily spend longer than that on their decompression stops. And so the final piece of the puzzle is saturation diving. The guys working on oil rigs at depth will make use of trimix, diving bells, and saturation habitats to spend as much as three weeks working at a particular depth or pressure. At the start of their tour, they'll be pressurized to a specific working depth or pressure in a saturation habitat on the ship. They'll then work, eat, and sleep at the same pressure for the entire duration of their working tour. When they start their work shift, they'll enter a diving bell and descend from the ship to their working depth. The internal pressure of the diving bell won't change between the saturation habitat on the ship and the depth that they're working. At the end of their working shift, the divers will enter the diving bell and ascend while maintaining the same internal working pressure. This means that they don't have to go through decompression at the end of every working shift. They are saturated with helium and nitrogen for the entire time that they're at pressure. At the end of their three-week tour, they'll spend a very long time in decompression. That means for a three-week tour, they'll only need to decompress at the end of their working tour. So now you know how decompression sickness works and how divers avoid decompression sickness from recreational divers right through to saturation divers spending weeks at pressure. By manipulating the three aspects of time, pressure and gas, you can avoid decompression sickness and make the most of your time underwater. If you're just getting started in diving, I've made a cheat sheet which you can download in the description of this video that'll give you a good idea of some of the equipment that I use and also where you can get started with the theory section of your open water diver course absolutely free.